Great. So welcome, everyone. Um, this is a showcase of open peer learning, and we're going to be talking about peer-to-peer -peer university. And I'm going to just start with some introductions. I'm Karen Sassenpower, and I work with the School of Ed at P2PU. And also joining us um, from Peer-to-Peer -peer University, I don't know that Philip Schmidt is going to be here. He, he was on a plane, and it was going to depend on his internet access there. Um, but he's the executive director of Peer-to-Peer -peer University. We also have Vanessa Generelli, who is the learning lead. And Jane Park, who is running the School of Open, which is launching just this week. And we are very excited about that. Um, and then I'll be talking about the School of Ed, and, and Vanessa will come back and talk about some new things going on at P2PU Labs. So while we're getting started, um, if everybody who's joining us could just type in the chat and introduce yourself, and maybe tell us where you're joining us from. And we'll just give everybody a minute to do that while we get started. And please feel free to ask questions anytime um, during this session. And we've got a we've got a nice cozy little group, so we should have plenty of time um, for questions. And if you would like to grab the microphone at some point, um, we can do that as well. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Vanessa to give an introduction of what Peer to Peer University is all about. Awesome. Thanks, Karen. And thank you for putting this together. Uh, we did one of these last year, and it was super fun. And I appreciate you wrangling all of us cats um, together here. Uh, P2PU, Peer to Peer University, is an open learning community of around 30,000 users on p2pu.org. Um, and when we say open, what that means is the material is open. It's a, a CCBY SA license. Um, the gates are open, anyone can join, and, and the price, it, it's free, all the courses are free. Um, and our, our core values, since we started, reflect this commitment to openness. Um, and we support each other as a community as we learn new things together. So that's how our core values connect. Um, in 2009, we started as a wiki um, and a community. But then, uh, and then built a platform, p2pu.org, shortly thereafter. Uh, and that's, that's the place where both the School of Ed and the School of Open courses are hosted. Um, and as we've been running the platform over the past four years, uh, we've also established P2PU Labs, which is a series of experimental, innovative learning projects. That's my, my overview of P2PU. Thanks, Vanessa. So if anybody has any general questions about P2PU, um, just go ahead and type them into the chat. But otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Jane now to talk about um, the School of Open, which we are very excited about the launch of happening this week. And I'll put a link up in the chat as well. Sure. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, so I'm Jane, and I work for Creative Commons as a project manager in education. But I um, work with P2P. Uh, P2P is our collaborating organization, and we are collaborating on this initiative called the School of Open, which fits within P2P. Uh, for those of you who don't know, P2P is made up of several different schools that focus on different domains. So other P2P schools include you know, School of Ed, which Karen's going to talk about later, School of Mathematical Futures, School of Social Innovation, um, et cetera. And School of Open is one of the schools um, that we decided to start last year in July in Berlin. And we finally have gotten around to launching our first set of courses this week. Um, so essentially, School of Open, just like P2P, is a community of volunteers, except that it's a sub-community within P2P that is really passionate about open tools and open resources, things like open educational resources, open textbooks, open um, access to science and data, and stuff like that. And I'll say a little bit more about uh, the exact problem we're focusing on in a bit. But I wanted to um, point out, again, that the collaborating organizations behind School of Open are P2P and Creative Commons. 
Um, and I don't know how familiar you are with Creative Commons, so I thought I might say a few words about Creative Commons organization. Uh, so we're a nonprofit organization, and as many of you know, uh, we develop free copyright licenses. We're essentially um, providing the legal framework for sharing on the web. So we have a set of free copyright licenses that anyone can use to attach to their works so that you can grant copy and reuse permissions in advance. Um, and this kind of legal infrastructure started back in 2002 because of the default copyright laws in the U.S. and around the world that were increasingly restrictive. And people who wanted to share their works on the web uh, couldn't do so unless they made their own custom license um, or uh, which, you know, if you make a bunch of different custom licenses on works, they won't interoperate. And so Creative Commons decided to come up with a set of standard copyright licenses that anyone could use and that could work globally around the world. So here is our kind of suite of copyright licenses in our public domain CC0 tool. As you can see, it goes from the most free, which is public domain, to attribution only, to the least free, which is the attribution and commercial um, no derivatives license. Essentially, uh, P2P is at the, the third one from the top, the attribution share alike, which means that you are free to do anything with the work as long as you attribute the original creator. And if you make a derivative of the work, such as a translation of a P2P course, you have to put the exact same license on the work, on the derivative. So you have to share alike. Uh, so Creative Commons licenses are sort of the backbone behind the whole open educational resources movement that occurs worldwide. A lot of organizations within the movement use Creative Commons licenses for their educational resources, including MIT OpenCourseWare, Khan Academy, ARIA Africa, and of course P2PU. Uh, and because there are so many of these open educational resources that exist on the web, uh, we want people to really leverage them and maximize um, their use. But not everyone knows about these open resources and open tools. And so this is essentially the problem that the School of Open is trying to solve. We believe, as a community of volunteers, that open resources can improve access to and participation in research, education, technology, and culture, but that not enough people around the world know what open means or how to apply it, especially when it comes to practical use cases, like if you're an educator, um, how can you incorporate free and open tools into your classroom? How can you find open resources? How can you remix them? How can you attribute them? Um, how can you get your students to do the same? And so that's why we came up with the idea for the School of Open, to focus on uh, open tools and open resources and how we could reach the lay people around the world to really um, take advantage of them. And if you go to schoolofopen.org, that's the kind of shortcut URL to this landing page. So we launched just yesterday. I'm very excited to announce that. We, have, we launched with 13 new courses, four of which are facilitated courses, which means that uh, sign-up is open through this week until Sunday. And it will start next week or two weeks from now, depending on the course. And they will run for about six to seven weeks after that. So what, what I mean by a facilitated course is that there is one or two organizers behind the course that are doing all the kind of logistics of weekly webinars and meetings and responding actively um, to people um, when they submit their assignments. And these are some of our facilitated courses. This one I am going to run because I work for Creative Commons. I know about the licenses. Uh, so this is called Creative Commons for K-12 Educators. This one is not going to go dive in depth on copyright law. There's another course on that. But it's for K-12 educators who are interested in learning about Creative Commons licenses um, and incorporating Creative Commons license remix activities into their classrooms, this is the course for you. Um, I would say that it's not a huge time commitment, maybe one to two hours a week at the most. Um, and then maybe towards the end when there's a final project, you might want to put in a little bit more hours. But it's really kind of, you know, it's open to anyone to take. Um, please sign up through Sunday if you'd like to take it and go ahead and check it out. Um, it's, everything's going from schoolofopen.org. So this is the other course I alluded to, Copyright for Educators. This is if you have more time on your hands. This will take a little bit more time because copyright law is a very heady subject, um, especially in the United States. Um, Laura Quilter is a copyright expert in the U.S. and she is actually facilitating and running this course. And 
uh, you'll learn a lot about copyright law and what about how you can use resources in your classroom under fair use law um, and lots of other stuff. And we also have the Australian version of copyright for educators. That's not shown here, but you can if you live in Australia and you wanna you wanna learn about Australian copyright law, you can do that too. And then we have this course called Writing Wikipedia Articles, The Basics and Beyond. If you've never written a Wikipedia article or you have, but you want to improve how you write them so that your Wikipedia article, you know, gets an A grade or an A rating on the site, um, go ahead and sign up for this course. This is facilitated by two volunteers, uh, Pete Forsyth and Sarah Bristow, and they are they have been longtime volunteers with the Wikipedia community. And it's actually focused on people who know about open education so that they can improve OER articles on Wikipedia, but you don't have to know about open education to take this course. And then in addition to those four facilitated courses that I mentioned, we have nine more, actually um, probably 13 more because we had some challenges from last year that still exist on the site. So we have a lot of other courses that you can take at any time at your own pace. And what that means is the courses will always be on the website and they're kind of, they have asynchronous discussion forms attached to them so you can always respond to what people have done yesterday or a month ago or even a year ago um, and just kind of take it at your own pace and ask for feedback on the discussion form or on the various mailing lists. And you can, yes, and Karen's right, you can also get a group of your friends together um, and take the course yourself, um, even with a facilitator. So, and here is an example of a standalone course, Intro to Openness in Education. David Wiley, uh, many of you have heard of him, is one of the biggest open advocates in education and probably one of the original, um, you know, founders of the open education movement. He um, has uploaded his version of Intro to Openness in Education to the P2P site as part of the school's open, and it's it's a great course. We all, you know, we all, all of these courses went through community review. Um, this course is split up into several different modules, so you can actually pick and choose which one you want to focus on, especially if you already know more about education, but you don't know as much about open access. And this is Get Creative Common Savvy. This actually takes about half an hour to an hour to complete. If you have always wanted to become an expert on Creative Commons licenses, but the Creative Commons website is too hard to navigate. Uh, here are four simple tasks that you can go through to help you navigate the website and learn more about Creative Commons. And we've gotten a lot of good feedback on this challenge. People have gone through it and they say that, oh, we didn't realize Creative Commons licenses were so simple, and thanks for developing this course um, to help us understand it. And here's another example of a standalone course called Open Detective. Um, uh, volunteer at Open Michigan, uh, Victoria Lungu, she is a graduate student there, developed this. It's essentially about how to uh, distinguish between open and non-open content and the spectrum of you know, content in between um, that she developed. And there's a lot more courses. Just visit School of Open Network and you, will, um, you can sign up for the course of your choice. So very simply, uh, there's two steps uh, to signing up for a course or following a course. Once you're at schoolopen.org, just register for a PGPU account, and then you can sign up for the course of your choice. And the sign up button is usually on the bottom left under the menu navigation of that course is about page. And if you want to get more involved in the School of Open, you poke around and you read about School of Open, you're kind of getting excited and you think, well, you know, this is really great and I'm, and I'm really passionate about Open too, then I really um, encourage you to sign up for our announcements list. It's a very low traffic list. I send out an email about once every two months, mostly because I forget it exists, but because most of our discussion happens um, on our Google group and we also have that link from our uh, home page. So, and if you want to get involved in the community, you can go ahead and join that Google group and introduce yourself to the list. Um, before I end, I wanted to say a few words. Um, this is sort of unrelated, but sort of related as well. So Creative Commons has a global network of affiliate volunteers around the world. Um, and we have, you know, we had a volunteer in Syria, um, and his name was Basil Kartabel, and he did a lot of great volunteer work for us around education around Creative Commons licenses and open source software. But then last year, um, on March 15th, um, so this this Friday will be a one-year anniversary. He was detained by Syrian authorities 
um, without probable cause, without any cause actually, and he's been in Syrian jail for a year now, um, and we're doing a huge um, kind of effort campaign this Friday to kind of get him free from jail, not kind of, to get him free from jail. So we're hoping that with a big push, um, if you go visit freebazel.org, we can um, get him out of Syrian jail. And that's all. Thanks so much, Jane. Lots of really exciting stuff there. So I want to just um, pause for a minute and ad address a couple questions that came up in chat. And if people have other questions, um, this is a this is kind of a good break time to do this. Um, one question was, can you can you take the content that's in PDPU and move it elsewhere or put it, you know, put it on a, use it in other ways or put it in a different system. And there are there are several ways you can do that. First of all, all the content on PDPU is open licensed. So you can you can use it in other ways. And it's the CC by SA license, which just means you need to attribute the source, so say where you got it from, and then also license your derivative work under a similar sharing license, CC by SA. And the peer-to-peer -peer university site makes it really easy to do that by being able to clone courses. And that's something we do quite a lot and encourage people to do, to basically make a copy of a course, and then you can modify it for your own use. But I know also sometimes people want to take the content and use it on different platforms. Maybe you use, you know, you have an LMS that you use at your site or whatever, and you absolutely can use the content um, that's on P2PU for that. Again, just attribute your source and put it under a sharing license as well. And then we also had a, a little bit of chat going about um, students and teachers learning together, and I'm actually going to talk about a couple um, groups that we are doing that with in the School of Ed, so I'm, I'm anxious to talk more about that. Um, so again, if you have other questions, go ahead and type them into chat, but otherwise, I'm going to talk about the School of Education. So I got involved with Peer-to-Peer -peer University about two years ago, and I do, I my my sort of regular day job, or, or at least what it was then, was working with um, K-12 schools doing what was pretty traditional professional development. And I was really looking for different ways to approach professional learning because I felt like a lot of the workshops that districts were asking me to do, I didn't feel like were very authentic. It was mostly me standing up, sort of lecturing about not standing up and lecturing. It was kind of crazy. So I was looking for different learning models, and that's what brought me to P2PU. And the first group that I got involved in there was actually not in education. I, I, did a, I uh, helped facilitate a group around entrepreneurial marketing. And I really just fell in love with the community and the model at P2PU. And I immediately thought, you know, this has complete application to my work in K-12. And that was sort of the start of the School of Education. So we started um, about, I guess, about 18 months ago. and. The goal of the School of Education was really to look at, first of all, it's geared to K-12 teachers, and it was really to start looking at a different model for professional learning for teachers, and to have something that was more driven by the participants themselves, something that was more authentic, and not just sitting and having sort of content um, poured at people. And so we started. Um, with seven courses, and um, we, in, for the very first phase of this, we had uh, a small initial grant from the Hewlett Foundation to do this, and we put together seven courses that were pretty traditional high interest topics, and the first two um, courses that you see on this screen were part of our pilot offering, so one was on differentiating instruction, one was on writing in the common core, um, and we did, we did five other courses, one on social media, just a variety of topics um, that were things that people had expressed an interest in and that were sort of identified as high interest. And we had a really good um, start to these courses, and, but we also learned a lot as we went. So one of the things we learned as we, as we started off is that First of all, facilitation is really important, and we were fortunate to have just fantastic facilitators. 
Um, but one thing we found out that we didn't really expect was it's not, we found that it's not necessarily always conducive to peer learning to have someone who's an expert in their content area be the facilitator. Um, because people sort of tended to look to them as wanting them to teach. And it, it, sometimes it put a damper on the peer learning process, which was really interesting. That was something I didn't expect. Um, but the, just the facilitation skills were really important. Um, I would also say the first courses we did, and they're still available on Peer-to-Peer -peer University if anybody wants to you know, go through them or use the content. Um, they were pretty content heavy, though. And they were more traditional in that regard. So, so you know, like the differentiating instruction course, there were a lot of readings, videos. Um, and what we found over time is that people were much more engaged in the social aspect of these courses and really um, having deep conversations with each other about the topic at hand and that that was the most powerful part of these courses. So we've evolved the model quite a lot. Um, but another thing we found was that a lot of teachers, and I would say people in general, um, really weren't accustomed to peer learning and, and sometimes didn't know what it was or didn't know how to participate in it. And that's something I see a lot in the face-to-face -face workshops I do with people um, that they just don't, you know, if you say we're going to do peer learning, it's a new thing to people. So, you know, we kind of have to sort of ease into that and talk about what does peer learning look like. And so one of the things that came out of that was we actually did a group called Empower Your Personal Learning. And this was a group, or, uh, and I use the word group and course in, uh, interchangeably. We, we call them courses on on P2PU, but I think many of them look a lot like discussion groups. Um, so I do, I do use the term course. But we had a group of people who were involved in the first round of courses, and we started talking about this issue of what does it look like to take control of your own personal and professional learning as a teacher. And so we spun off a group on that topic. And that was really, I think, a breakthrough course for us because um, the participants really drove the content. And I think that's where we've seen that things have really gotten exciting is where sort of the group takes over the course and it's, it's just one big group of people co-facilitating. So that was a really, um, a really powerful group. And so there's a question in the chat about where these conversations would occur. Um, among these group members. And we've tried all different sorts of ways of doing this. And I would say the two main ways we do it, one is asynchronous through discussion threads on P2PU. So for each um, task or, or section of a P2PU course, there's a discussion thread. And we always try to have sort of hands-on um, prompts in the course that are discussion prompts that people can do asynchronously. And it's so, it's hard to schedule synchronous things. I'm sure we've all had this experience of trying to get everybody together online is challenging. Um, but we do also do that. And we, we've used a couple different platforms for that. We've used Big Blue Button, which is an open source web conferencing tool, I, I would say very similar to um, Blackboard Collaborate that we're using right now, but open source. Um, and then most recently, we have gone more to using G plus Hangouts, which we really love. And I'm using, I'm finding I'm using that for everything now because it's really easy to use. You can stream it live so that people um, who don't want to be actually in the room with you, but they can watch the video. And then it also automatically archives it to YouTube. So I would say that's kind of my platform of choice right now. Um, another question is about how long our courses are and, and the correlation between length of course and attrition rate, absolutely. So in the first, at least, and I'm speaking now for the School of Ed, and I would say this varies hugely across different, different um, spaces within P2PU. And we really encourage people to try anything that you think might work. And I think my favorite thing about P2PU is that it really is kind of a giant sandbox to try different things. Um, but when we started the courses, when we started the School of Ed courses, they were, they were all, except for one, they were six weeks long. And we felt like six weeks was long enough to get in depth, but not too long to lose people. And since then, we've shortened them. So I would say right, right now, our, 
our ideal length at School of Ed where we feel like people can get into a topic but we don't lose them is about three weeks. And what we've started doing is doing three-week courses and then try to spin off other groups so that maybe, you know, we do a group on, you know, ePortfolios for Teachers was another one that, that the participants came up with. And at the end of that course, we start looking at, you know, where, where do we as a group want to go with this next? And I think that works well in terms of a time frame that people can stay with it, but it also is a prompt to people in the group to think about where do they want to go next. And I would say that's another challenge is just soliciting um, requests from the community of what, you know, what do you guys want to do? And I think, you know, again, that's something that a lot of teachers have said to me, no one's ever asked me that before. No one's ever said, what do you want to learn? And that it just is a different frame of thinking. So that's kind of, that's kind of where we've gone. Um, a couple other things that have spun out of the community that are really exciting to me, one is courses that are teachers and students learning side by side. So um, we have a group going right now, and this is the second run of this course called Student Grant Writing. And this is a group where students are coming up with community service learning projects and they're defining those projects and then writing grants for them um, in the P2PU community. So then we also have mentors and other organizations that are jumping in and helping them. And that project came um, from a teacher that I had worked with in Delaware named Harry Brake. And Harry had done this before in a face-to-face -face setting at his school in Delaware. And then a couple of years ago, he took a job at the American School in um, Mexico City. And now he's doing this online with us at P2PU. And if you, that course is going right now. If you want to jump on and look at it, there's a school in Africa that they've partnered with that they're writing, they're trying to write a grant for hardware, um, and just people from all over the world. And it's, it's really exciting. And I think it's a great um, example of authentic sort of student-driven work um, with just a lot of collaboration of other people. Another um, exciting project is, that is one that we're working with, the National Writing Project, who I just can't say enough good things about National Writing Project. They've been, um, a lot of people in the Writing Project have, have jumped into the School of Ed and they've just been phenomenal to collaborate with. Um, one of the teachers there, um, his name is Paul Allison, and he teaches in the Bronx, and he does a thing called Youth Voices, and I'll put a, I'll put a link up here. I, I missed the hot link, hang on. Um, but this is a student blogging platform where students do projects um, that they come up with the topics of, and then it's, it's, he's expanded that to have a Common Core aligned full curriculum. And the fit with P2PU is he's now using this on P2PU for badges. And the students' badges actually count toward credit for their graduation. And I had the, um, I had the fortune to go visit Paul's school and do some ongoing work with him. And it's just really, really powerful stuff. So if you go to the School of Ed, there are a whole bunch of courses. The one that's in the middle of the screen that says Citing Evidence and Conversations, that's one of, I think, about I don't know how many, 20-some challenges that he has up. And they all have that black and white icon if you want to um, explore those. But really, really good stuff. And I just, did a, um, I just did a talk at South by Southwest about some of his work if you're interested in more information. Um, a couple of other courses we have going on right now. We have a youth makerspace, which is the idea is to have a kind of an online makerspace to prompt people to start um, working on maker projects. And then we also have a subgroup um, for the Learning Creative Learning course. And I think Vanessa is going to talk more about that in a minute. But that is a, a very large MOOC that's being offered by MIT Media Lab in collaboration with Peer-to-Peer -Peer University. Um, and we set up sort of a small group to do some discussions around that on P2PU. So those are some things we have going on right now. Um, we are, we're, we're just in the process of looking at some new courses. Um, so this is a, just a little bit about what we've learned, and I think I've talked 
I think I've talked mostly about this already. Um, but I would invite anybody who's interested in this to join us at um, the School of Ed, either join a course or we would love to have suggestions for courses that you would be interested in. Um, one of the things we're working on right now, and this is, this is something that came up actually during a webinar a group of us did for the ET MOOC about open educators. And it was a really good discussion, and so a group of us said, oh, we should do a, we should do a course on P2PU about just open learning, and not, not even so much the OER licensing part of it, but just what does open learning look like, and what does transparency in the classroom look like, and how does it change us as teachers and learners. And so I'm going to post a link, um, but where we are right now in the process, and this is something that we found works really well, is when there's a group of people who are interested in starting a course like this, um, we try to brainstorm it collaboratively and, and sort of write, write the course outline together. So a way that we've done that that seemed to work really well is through a Google Doc. So the link that I put up just now is a Google Doc that is just brainstorming what an open learning group might look like. So we have things like who's interested in being a part of this, what might be some essential questions we would explore, um, what, are some, what are some projects we might do together as a part of this group. And I'm thinking that this group will probably start late spring or, or early summer. There's, I think there's also a place on that Google Doc to say when it would be good for you to start because it's always a challenge to have sort of everybody have time to do this. But if you're interested in a group on open learning, um, or just have ideas about it, please jump in and um, look at that Google Doc and let us know you're, you're um, interested. And then the last sort of um, invitation I would extend is to help us think through the intersections of what we're doing at the School of Ed with formal professional development activities at schools. Um, because that's right now the School of Ed is all um, individual teachers who are just opting in to do this because they think it's important for their professional learning um, and they're interested in it. Um, but what we're interested in is finding a couple schools who would be interested in taking this peer learning model and applying it to their institutional professional development. To, so to really look at um, some ways to use this at their school. So if anybody is interested in that um, or would like to talk more about that, um, I'll also put my email and our emails and, and Twitter handles are at the end of this presentation as well. But I would just say, you know, I, I love P2PU and I've really enjoyed um, groups I've been there as a part of School of Ed and other things. So if you are on this session and you haven't participated, um, please join us and jump in and see what it's all about. And with that, um, I'll sort of catch up on questions in chat. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa to talk about the P2PU labs. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so as I mentioned, in addition to P2PU.org, where uh, the School of Open and School of Ed courses live, we've undertaken several learning experiments under the banner of P2PU labs. Um, and one that we are particularly proud of is called the Mechanical MOOC. Uh, and the Mechanical MOOC grew out of the MOOC mania of 2012. Um, but, you know, it, this was when edX rolled out and MITx and Coursera and Udacity and, and um, everything that, uh, that went on with Virginia. Um, and so we we took a step back and looked at what the issues that we thought were problematic about MOOCs. Um, and one of the things is that even though they're super popular, they, they cost a lot of money. <laughs> it wasn't, it, it didn't just uh, scale up as an, as an affordable option. Uh, it's reported that per Coursera course development, the development costs are between twenty-five dollars uh, and $50,000 per course. Um, and that's just content development. That isn't tech. And that's just the first time the course is run. It doesn't include uh, later iterations that are improvements. So $50,000 per course pretty steep. 
Um, and many of these MOOCs were, were actually closed experiences. They were open in the sense that anyone could sign up for them, but the content was closed and it was within a closed platform. Um, and, and we also saw significant problems with the, the sort of automation of learning, the sort of, uh, it, the sort of observing student usage data and learner usage data and seeing and seeing learners just as moving through a path and 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 information as opposed to more um, interactive uh, interactive experiences around real projects. So when we step back, we we really wanted to linger in the problem space before we could approach the solution space. Um, and this is where we begin to think about what, what would a MOOC that is a P2P styled MOOC look like? Uh, and, and how can we create an experience that's better, um, that has more peer interaction, more project-based learning, um, but is low cost and low friction? Um, and you know, we wanted it to be cheaper and using open materials, and we wanted to create something that others could easily use to bootstrap courses of their own. Uh, and so the Mechanical MOOC was born. <laughs> it currently lives at mechanicalmooc.org. Um, and this was a partnership, or is a partnership, between OpenStudy, MIT, OpenCourseWare, Codecademy, and PPU. Um, this was a gentle introduction to, to Python. Um, it used MIT's open textbook material, uh, the exercises on Codecademy for Python, and uh, learners had QA on OpenStudy. Um, and, and for this course, there was, there was no instructor, there was no curriculum designer. Um, PDPU hosted, hosted uh, the content for the course, and we also formed the scripts that made small groups around the content, and those small groups were uh, conducted over email. Yes, the course is about learning how to program using Python, and it's a, a gentle introduction to Python. Um, and what we were, PDPU has been interested in, uh, in forming more of a research agenda around, around learning and these experiments in learning. So when we formed these, these small groups, we based the small groups um, on level of experience with the material because we, want, we wanted, uh, I, did a, I actually did a literature review on what forms the best, uh, the best learning cohorts online and the literature indicated that we should have a mix of experience. Um, we also had a mix of learning styles. We asked people how they learn best and it was based on their self-reported data. Um, and we also grouped them based on time zone um, in the hopes that that might prompt some synchronous meeting um, organically. So uh, in, addition, in addition to uh, a script and an experiment, uh, the mechanical MOOC is also a character. And uh, what we know from, uh, from research specifically in the realm of, uh, of universal design for learning, is that, uh, is that humor enhances memory and engagement um, and, and it prompts that sort of effective dimension for, to the learning experiment, uh, experience. So we decided to launch the gentle introduction to Python course from the perspective of a lovable steampunk international man of mystery robot. Um, and you can see, um, and you can see him here, MOOC, we, uh, all of the contents of the, or in the copy from the course was written from this little guy's point of view and uh, all the emails and also this Twitter feed. And uh, learners really seem to enjoy uh, the, the content from the, uh, from the mechanical MOOC, our, our man of mystery. So uh, the results for the first round of a gentle introduction to Python were that um, 575, 5,775 folks initially registered, um, and between 2,733 and 1,650 were still with the course in the last in the last week. Um, we found in the first iteration of the course that if people signed up and we just grouped them and said, "Okay, go," 
the all the drop off before the course started left some groups half formed. So in the second uh, in second iteration of the course, we introduced this ready to go step. So people could sign up for a window of two weeks, um, but we sent them a note that was like, "Do you want to learn with a group? Okay, are you ready to learn with a group now?" Um, and when we prompted that sort of that sort of intermediary steps, uh, we saw that there was more cohesion uh, in the groups. And now we're on our third round of signups, so the the mechanical MOOC is on its uh, its third life. Um, findings and implications. So we we learned a lot, uh, you know, based on the successes and the lessons learned in this Python course. Uh, our executive director, Philip Schmitz, uh, who is now actually a fellow at the MIT Media Lab, um, partnered with Mitch Resnick at the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab to adapt Mitch's pre-existing course, Learning Creative Learning, for a mechanical MOOC style experience. Um, and and this, uh, this course was posted on, on Lifehacker, it was featured on Lifehacker, and now it has over 10,000 people participating in the very robust uh, Google Plus community, in addition to having this course on pdp.org. Um, and amazing things are happening when you open up open learning to learners. Um, one, one thing that happened sort of organically is that uh, a learner in this course made a map of where all the learners for learning creative learning are, and people added themselves to that map. So that sort of building a social dimension and, and people being able to visualize their community at a high level, which I think is super cool. Um, and what we also noticed in this in this course is that some people who were friends in real life already uh, took this course together, like formed book clubs uh, around this course, which is super cool. Um, now anyone anyone can get a course off the ground that's in this style uh, that would like to use the mechanical MOOCs technical infrastructure that goes up on GitHub and I'll post the links. Um, and in the future, we'll be attempting a similar project-based peer learning mechanical MOOC for the School of Data, uh, a database expedition is what it will be called, um, and that'll be opening for sign up around April 1st. That's the story with how the mechanical MOOC was born. Thanks, Vanessa. Good stuff. So does anyone have questions? Um, and we can certainly open microphones up to people if they want to talk. Um, there's some good chat going on around sort of different ways of keep, keeping people engaged in groups like this. I think the Google Calendar idea. Vanessa, do you know if anybody's done a Google Calendar for a P2P U course so that it would automatically pop up. I, we think you have to subscribe to the calendar. Uh, right. Well, actually, we've community-wise, we've um, we've changed the community call to now appear on people's Google calendars uh, as a reminder. We used to just send them like a note that the the call will be happening. But what's great about Google Calendar is that it adjusts for your time zone. Um, right. And we have actually, I, you know, I. I don't have like quantitative data to back this up, and I would wonder if Jane, you could, uh, you had any ideas about this. But I actually think that I've seen like very much increased engagement since we since we did that on um, for the community call. Vanessa, can you talk about what the community call is and when it is, and sort of invite people if they'd like to participate in it? I would love nothing more, Karen. Um, on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, let me actually pull up the link real quick. Uh, the community call. This is what this is what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, on Thursdays, we invite everyone who is part of the PDPU community or curious about PDPU um, to see not only what the staff of PDPU are working on. It, everyone shares their process, priorities, problems. And uh, there's a fourth P. What's the fourth P? It's gone now. Um, but we, but we usually uh, there isn't uh, a Twitter chat, but there is an Ether we Ether chat. It's a we have it in a Google Hangout, and then the notes are posted on the blog too. So even if you can't make the meeting, 
um, there there are ways to to catch up on what's going on. So we we um, so what the PDPU community is up to, they share with the group. And there's also usually some kind of activity like over the past two weeks. That everyone on the community call has reviewed School of Open courses, uh, and I actually think that that feedback has been really robust and interesting, and I've really enjoyed getting to know the School of Open courses. Um, and, uh, and we also have sort of uh, process discussions, like, um, uh, you know, what is the newsletter for? Uh, who, how should how should we blog to the world? Um, uh, it, it's it's just a it's a time when we get to sort of talk about like the nitty gritty of what we're working on, but also reflect on our purpose as an organization. Um, and I look forward to it on every Thursday, and I welcome you guys to join us. And there is a link in the chat to the um, Etherpad about that is the community meeting. And I'll say for myself, it's, it's often at a time that's really hard for me to be on the community call, but a lot of times I'll jump on the etherpad and just look at what's going on and sometimes chime in. So if you're interested in having input, and I would say my experience with P2PU is it's really a community project. And there are a lot of people who are really involved doing all kinds of stuff um, in the community, it's sort of in the way that Wikipedia is. And I'm in a lot of online communities. I'm not in that many that are so participative and just have a lot of really generous, giving, collaborative people. So it, it's, it's a fun place. Jane, you want to talk about the School of Open call? Sure. Um, it's essentially, you know, another micro community within P2P who want to focus on the School of Open. Uh, courses and what might be next for the schools open, and we only have that about once a month because um, there's already the weekly PUPU community call, and when it comes to products, of course, don't, there's only so much time people can give. So that's on the second Tuesday of each month, and the details for that um, call outlined at the pad that I just pasted in. Awesome. And the School of Ed does not have a community call, though we've had a few people express an interest in it. Um, we do have a, a mailing list and a listserv. If you go to the School of Ed page on P2PU, you can sign up for that. And we've just sort of, we've done our community work more at the course level, where if somebody has an idea for something, we all kind of try to jump on a Google Doc and then maybe a Hangout down the road to talk about things. But if people are interested in more frequent community calls for School of Ed, that certainly is something we could look at. Any other questions or comments or things that people want to talk about? Um, I did put in the chat that um, for those of you who are on Twitter, um, P2PU has an account on Twitter, and also the um, P2PU hashtag is pretty active. So you, if you're interested in just sort of seeing what's going on with P2PU and you're on Twitter, um, check out that hashtag. For me, I know I'm on Twitter. That's probably one of the best ways for me to get information. So that's something I definitely monitor. No, that's a good idea, Peggy, to put a link to the time zone conversion. Any other questions people have or any suggestions for things that you would like to see on P2PU? We've talked about sort of some specific areas, but almost anything you can imagine learning about um, is good fodder for P2PU. So if people have suggestions um, for School of Ed or School of Open or just any topic at all, um, we would love to hear those. I see some interesting um, chat stuff about notifications. And I think that's something that we always um, sort of struggle with, having a balance between notifications of what's going on a in a course that are often enough to keep you engaged, but that aren't so frequent that it just goes crazy on your email. Um, so there is 
the, the newest version of P2PU is now using Discus for comments. And the default is you don't get notifications of comments, but if you scroll down to the bottom of the thread, you can enable that. And that's something I know it's changed a little bit, so a couple people have asked about. There's a question about how often we rerun sessions, and that's really up to, it's kind of up to the community. So any session, any course on P2PU can be rerun by anybody by cloning it and just sort of starting a new version of it. Um, so anybody could do that, but then sometimes we also, as a community, we get together and say, you know, there's certain courses we, we want to rerun or there's certain groups that are really interested, in, like the student grant writing we've done um, each spring. Um, sometimes a school, like School of Open, might decide after their first run of courses, you know, based on interest level or whatever, that they want to rerun them periodically. Um, but it is, it's flexible for anybody to rerun a course. At School of Ed, we've rerun a few, but at least from the community standpoint, mostly we've spun off sort of the next iteration of things. And I think particularly the people who have facilitated and been through a course, we're kind of all ready to go on to the next thing. So it's kind of, it's an interesting challenge because there are often people who missed, like I know the writing in the Common Core was a really popular course we ran, and there's people who missed the first run and want to want to take it again, um, and that option is always there. We just, at least at the School of Ed, we really um, rely on hearing from people about what they're interested in. So definitely if you see something that you're interested in having um, something rerun, just let us know that. And there's another question about do people participate in both School of Open and School of Ed? Um, School of Open is brand new, but I would definitely say there's a lot of overlap. And we also sometimes co-offer co, um, a course between two groups. So Jane and I have just sort of preliminary talk, talk that it might, you know, it might make sense to do, do like copyright for educators to also offer that um, under School of Ed. It, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't particularly matter what school a course is in. Anybody can participate in anything, but it's just sort of how we organize things and how we organize our communities. So that's a good question. I'm catching up. Is my audio back or am I? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Okay, good, thank you. And there will be um, a link to this webinar. Um, I believe it'll be on the Open Education Week site. And um, we'll also post it um, on P2PU and we'll also tweet it out. And the slides for this are on SlideShare if people are interested in the slides. Any closing comments? Um, Jane or Vanessa that you'd like to make? Um, just that to please check out schoolofopen.org um, and let us know um, what, what, if you have any feedback um, to join our discussion list in our community. Vanessa, closing thoughts? No, oh, you, got, you got that link up there before I did. Okay, so there's the slide link. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. And please um, spread the word to others that you, that you know or work with about P2PU, because I think it's just a great collection of learning opportunities um, that can be used for all sorts of things. And we are, you know, we are excited and supportive of people reusing the content in other ways as well. So if you have opportunities for that within your own organization and you would like support, um, please email any of us. And um, our emails and Twitter are up there. And we are also available through the P2PU website. So thank you so much for being here. And we'll hope to see you online soon.